Good morning, everybody. I am so excited to be here this morning talking with you about Jesus. And I want to start with a story from my ministry. So shortly after I was hired by my current church, the seniors in my high school youth group came up to me and they told me this. We use the Bibles as doorstops in the youth room. And I thought for sure that these guys were kidding. I mean, I was just hired as their youth pastor, so I walked in and I began to set up a pretty traditional youth ministry in which I made them pull out the Bible so that they could learn about Jesus. And what happened is that this group of seniors began to hate me because I was making them talk about Jesus through the lens of scripture. They detested this practice so much that they actually went around my back to my boss and demanded a meeting. And so my boss set up a meeting with them and with me. And in the course of this meeting, what I learned from them was essentially their vision of what a good youth ministry looks like. And what they told me is that a good youth ministry is a place where teens can go and hang out, eat good food, play games, and talk about anything they wanted to as long as it didn't involve scripture or Jesus. So in response to this, my boss asked me, can you live with that? (laughs) No joke, she really did. (laughs) She followed that up with what is so wrong with having a place where teens want to come? My response was nothing if you're a YMCA or a community center or a park district, but everything if you're the church because the church is rooted in Christ. So if we're not talking about him, who are we? What are we doing? How can we call ourselves a youth ministry if we're not centered on Jesus? Now maybe you think your youth ministry is centered on Jesus. I used to think that too. Even in the midst of this conflict that I just described, I thought that my youth ministry was centered on Jesus. After all, I am a follower of Jesus. I like to think that he is the foundation for everything that I do in both my life and in my ministry. And I thought that that showed in what I was teaching the kids. So imagine my surprise when prompted by a graduate school class, I went and I started interviewing the kids in my youth ministry about their beliefs in Jesus. And what I found was that there was a huge gap between what my students believed and understood and what I thought they should believe and understood about Jesus based on what I knew I had been teaching them. So I began to wonder if I was just a lousy youth worker, which was entirely possible, or if there was something more to this, if this phenomena was wider spread. So my curiosity led me to begin investigating this on a wider scale. So for a year, I studied this, and I surveyed 369 high school students from 16 different states in order to find out their beliefs about Jesus. I also went into four representative congregations. And in those congregations, I did three things. First of all, I went and I observed something, a youth ministry program, a church service, something to give me an idea of how, if at all, Jesus was being taught in those ministries. I also interviewed both the youth pastor as well as the senior pastor in order to find out what their personal beliefs about Jesus were and how those beliefs were influencing their ministry. And lastly, I held a focus group for both the youth group kids, the high school kids, as well as their parents in order to find out what they believed about Jesus and why. And what I found is that teens don't know much about Jesus. In a word, their Christologies or their beliefs about Jesus are poor. To show you what I mean, consider these statistics. 44% of the teens I surveyed didn't believe that Jesus is God. 49% of students thought that Jesus sinned. 58% didn't believe that Jesus was crucial to the Christian faith, meaning they thought you could be a Christian and not actually believe in Jesus. Now those statistics are dismal, but they still only tell us so much. So I wanted to go further. So I also asked teens questions, including who is Jesus? I asked them this on the survey so I could get a pretty wide response from teenagers, and also so that I could see their answers without any constraints placed upon them. 
I then took their responses and I grouped like-minded responses and put them under headings in order to essentially create these archetypes, these patterns of thoughts or images to help us understand what teenagers believe about Jesus. And I found six that were dominant amongst teenagers. Now each of these archetypes are universally present, meaning they're everywhere. And the other thing about them is that they contain attributes that are actually found in scripture. So consider, for example, superhero Jesus. Superhero Jesus was sent to save our world from destruction. Superhero Jesus benefits humankind because he's all about conquering his nemesis, Satan. And in the process, he frees the world from darkness. Superhero Jesus also has supernatural powers, and these supernatural powers give him fame and notoriety. Some of those powers include superhuman strength, which enable him to perform miracles, as well as invisibility, which enable him to go everywhere and be everywhere. Superhero Jesus is willing to sacrifice himself in order to redeem the world. However, death cannot defeat him, which means that he always emerges victorious. The next archetype is Mr. Rogers Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rogers Jesus is a kind teacher who models the various types of moral behaviors that he expects to see in his followers. Things like acceptance and devotion, generosity and honesty, love and truthfulness, selflessness and respect. Mr. Rogers Jesus is incredibly nice. He is a perpetual do-gooder, but he's also one-dimensional meaning he never struggles with anger or really with any complex emotions whatsoever. The next one is Godlike Jesus. Godlike Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit <laughs> and is capable of performing miracles. He is a higher power that students describe using various God language, things like son of God, son of man, spirit of God. The problem is teens don't actually understand what any of those phrases mean. And as a result, even though they believe in God-like Jesus, they don't actually think that God-like Jesus is God. The next one is spiritual guru Jesus. Spiritual guru Jesus has a very special relationship with God. And that enables him to essentially serve as a bridge between humans and God. That, in turn, allows him to intercede on our behalf. Spiritual guru Jesus believes in God, just like you and I do. The next one is Joe Jesus. Joe Jesus is the one <laughs> that focuses on Jesus' humanness. He was a Jerusalem resident. He's the son of Mary. He's the guy next door and every man. He's super relatable, which means that this Jesus is the Jesus that you want as your friend. In the words of one teens, he's everyone. You can't really distinguish who he is. In every person's eyes, he can look different. And the last one is King Jesus. King Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the Prince of Peace. He is a leader who rules by power. Now, as I said before, each of these archetypes contain elements of truth. Right? They contain some things that are in scripture. The problem is that none of these archetypes accurately portray the orthodox, the complete Jesus that we see in scripture. And as a result, each of these pictures of Jesus fails at some point. And the problem is when these pictures of Jesus fail, so does the faith of our students, which is rendered impotent. Here's what I mean. Well, we believe that in a time of crisis, superhero Jesus will show up and rescue us from our enemies. We're unsure if he'll stay when the crisis is over. Our hope in superhero Jesus essentially wanes whenever we confront small problems because we're pretty convinced that superheroes don't have time for small problems. Mr. Rogers Jesus fails because he's too nice to confront the real injustices of our world. As a result, we don't believe that he can actually do anything about things like poverty and genocide and world hunger. In short, Mr. Rogers Jesus makes a good neighbor, but a really bad leader. 
God like Jesus fails because quite simply, he isn't God. So he has the power to perform miracles, but that power is always tied to something else. As a result, it's ultimately limited. And as much as he might want to, he cannot actually fix everything. Spiritual guru Jesus fails because even though he believes in God, again, he isn't actually God himself. As a result, he can intercede for us, but he can't actually intervene in our problems. At best, he can provide us with the type of good advice or counseling that you might receive from a skilled pastor or a therapist. Joe Jesus fails because he's just like us, and so he can't fix anything that we can't actually fix ourselves. He can sit with us in the storms of life, but he can't actually calm them. And King Jesus fails because he reigns through power. And we all know all too well that power corrupts. As a result, we fear that King Jesus will someday actually become dictator Jesus, far more concerned about his own interests than about ours. Given the way in which all of these archetypes fail at some point, is it any wonder that so many of our teens don't actually think that Jesus is God? If that was the picture of Jesus that I had, I wouldn't believe that he was God either. And if Jesus isn't God, then do his life and teachings matter any more than that of you or I? If Jesus isn't God, then how could he have performed miracles, let alone the greatest miracle of all, the one on which our faith is based, his resurrection from the dead? If Jesus isn't God, then how could he make a difference in our lives, in our churches, or in the world around us? Of course, the answer to all three of those questions is that if Jesus isn't God, he couldn't do any of those things. And that's why it's critically important for we as pastors, as youth pastors, as adult leaders in our youth ministry, as parents who care about the faith formation of our team, that we teach kids to know and understand and love the real, orthodox, complete Jesus, because that Jesus never fails. That Jesus is complete. In him, power meets compassion, distance meets the incarnation. Through him, we have hope that ultimately good will triumph over evil. Through the cross, we know that death has been defeated. And through Jesus' resurrection, we believe that even now, he is redeeming the world and making all things right. In the real, complete, orthodox Jesus, we also have the hope of a relationship. We know that what matters to us matters to Jesus, and what matters to Jesus also shapes us. In him, we also have the promise of Jesus' presence. We trust that he'll stay long after a crisis abates, and that we'll powerfully encounter him, not only in the extraordinary tragedies in our lives, but also in the ordinary moments of our lives, those moments in which most of life is lived. It's that Jesus that I want my teens to know. And I'm guessing it's that Jesus that you want your teens to know as well. And if that's the case, then in all you do, remember that Jesus is the one on whom Christianity stands or falls. So make Jesus, not gimmicks, not entertainment, not games, not camps, not mission trips. Make Jesus the focal point of your ministry. Boldly proclaim that Jesus is both fully God and fully human. Affirm his perfection and courageously assert that he alone is the way to eternal life later and abundant life now. And know that when you introduce teens to that Jesus, far from producing an impotent faith, you'll create in them a consequential faith, the type of faith that actually matters, that makes a difference, not only in their lives, but in our churches and in the world around us. Thank you.